always fun. Little kids make them their desires known in the congregation. Hallelujah. But you know what? You know what we get to do together is we get to take care of each other together. We walk through stuff. We, we I mean, we do that, right? It's like this, this Christmas season, New Year's season. I know even in this congregation, there are several of you, and there are some who aren't he- here today. You've had great loss this year. You know, that there's, a, there's a lot of folks who, during the season, during this Christmas time, maybe their hearts are heavy. And so if you know of somebody, you know, this year, last year, whatever, who's had some of that kind of loss, my encouragement for you is to let them know that you're thinking about them and praying for them. Because you know what? Sometimes... After the hustle and bustle of, of family coming around and, th- you know, all the busyness and all the things, when we're quiet and we're by ourselves, that's, that's the hard part. You know, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 says that we ought to comfort others with the comfort with which we have been comforted. In other words, we've gone through stuff. Anybody here gone through stuff? I've gone through some stuff. And it's good if you see somebody going through, through their stuff put your arm around them, say, and not a lot of words, because you know what, most of us, I'm looking in the mirror, most of us talk too much, and, and your presence is really a, are, are, is, pre, is a present, most of the time people don't need necessarily all of our words, they just need our hand on their shoulder, say, so you know what, I don't know what you're going through, and I know it must be heavy, but I'm, I'm here for you, and I'm praying for you. That's most of the time what people need. We always get in that awkward thing of, uh, 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 and then we throw out some Bible verse like, uh, Lord helps those who help themselves. Oh, wait, that's not a Bible verse. Um, or all that glistens is gold. No, no, wait, that's not a Bible verse. Um, how about all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord, call according to his purpose. Now, that's a Bible verse, but we wield it around, and people are like, well, how is that supposed to help me? I just hurt. You know, it's the right verse for the right time, but save it for later. Because what, a lot of times what people need is they just need you. And I'm not real good at that sometimes. I, I am not mercy gifted, but I'm mercy responsible. Anybody else? Um, I'm not administratively gifted, but I'm administratively responsible. I am exhortation gifted, and I'm exhortation responsible. So, some of those things we're supposed to do, but I'm not real good at it. And, but some of you are awesome at it. So tend to the people around you. Uh, it goes a long way to show the love of Christ as we do this stuff together. Um, as we're going to walk through the scriptures today, mainly in the book of Luke, so we're going to go around Luke a little bit. So if you can sort of find the gospel according to Luke, we're going to go there. Um, I always liked this season, this time of the year. Um, When I was in high school, I played football, loved it. I was going to play in college, ended up following Jesus to do some other stuff. But I I love the game. I love to watch people get hit so hard their head goes back in the name of Jesus. I I love that. I just miss it, you know. Um, So this time of year is really, I mean, you got basketball coming up. you, you You got football and all that stuff. And bowl games, and you get to see the guy after the bowl game, the coach. And, and there's usually a lot of different ways the coach can go. <clears throat> if you're Nick Saban, you're just stoic. Yep, Alabama should have won, but we let ourselves down. Like, what? Those other guys weren't better than you, you know? Um, some coaches get on there, and they blame their team. Or they say, well, we traveled a long way to get here. Oh, we had a long offseason. season." There's, there's just a, a lot of excuses, right? What, what they all just need to be able to say is, uh, we blew it. We lost. I mean, they, they ought to be able to just own it, right? That, but, but in that situation where all the lights are on you, you sort of make excuses. I would hope in my own life that I could get to the point where I just own stuff Yep, blew that. Yep, forgot that one. Yeah, I just didn't even do that because I didn't want to. Imagine how honest that would be. <laughs> well, yeah, that's uncomfortable, isn't it? I didn't do that. Just, I just didn't want to, Julie. <laughs> you know. Um, but I'm looking at 2020 coming up, okay? 2020 has a lot. This, this year, it's 
a lot of big stuff coming at me and my family, and probably you and yours, or it ought to. And really, I'm looking at 2020 as the year of no excuses, all right? The year of no excuses. The year of no excuses for me in my spiritual walk, in my physical health, in my stuff. 2020, I'm, I'm writing it down. We did our gifts to Jesus last week because, you know, it's Jesus' birthday. and We ought to give him something, right? So we write out our gifts to Jesus. And one of those things for me is I wrote out 2020, the year of no excuses, that I don't, I don't need any more excuses on, on carrying a few extra pounds. Right now, I'm carrying about a middle schooler. You know, just something I got to do, you know. So the 2020 year of no excuses, man, I'm, I'm January 1. Okay, not the first, but the second <laughs> is, the, is the beginning, right? That I have a plan. I'm putting something in place. I, I have a destination, a goal. I'm, I'm going to accomplish this. And, and I've got to get it done, right? I, I, I don't need any excuses. I just need to do it. Or my relationship with my wife. I could say, well, you don't understand. She's a bossy thing. Well, are, aren't they all? Okay. But you know what? I, all joking aside, all joking aside, the dude in the mirror is the one I've got to deal with, right? And in my marriage relationship, She's got her stuff, but I just need to out-love her, out-serve her, and love her like Christ loved the church. That This ought to be the year of no excuses, right? That, that we don't just say we're going to have a date night, but we do, right? We don't just say these things, but we put together a plan that usually on Saturday mornings, I make her cup of tea, I make my cup of coffee, and we sit and we talk. Women sort of like that thing, right? Talking relationship, all that stuff, right? It's, it's the year of no excuses. In my marriage, I need to set a priority, and I just need to stop setting excuses and blaming somebody else or, or saying I'm too busy or whatever else, and just, just do it. In the words of the great theologian Yoda, <laughs> there is no try, there is only do, Right? <laughs> It's one of those kind of things that, that i got to stop giving lip service to a whole lot of things. Don't we do that? We give lip service to a whole bunch of stuff. And here's the biggest one for most of us, our relationship with God. Right? Stephen Covey talks about uh, how the, there's the, the things that we ought to do. There's this, the urgent and the important. And most of us, we live in the area of the urgent, that there are these things that, that come up and they've got to be done. We're always living in drama. We're always living in an emergency. And we're taking care of the urgent, but we don't take care of the important. It's like I drive my car all the time, and if my car has a flat tire, that's urgent. It's immediate. But the important thing is I ought to get the oil check once in a while. I ought to air up my tires. I ought to do the maintenance. Because if I do those important things, they'll be less urgent things. Does that make sense? But we as a people spend so much time on the urgent emergency stuff that we spend so little time on the important things that we feel like we can put off and do later. 2020, folks, it ought to be the year of no excuses that I'm not putting off the important things till someday when they're urgent, but I'm making the priority to do the stuff now. Now. I heard a phrase a long time ago that said, you are only as close to God as you want to be. Let that sink in. It's not my time. It's not my schedule. It's not the people around me. It's nothing else. I look at the guy in the mirror, and the guy in the mirror for me is my biggest problem usually, and, and, and I'm only as close to God as I want to be. I, you and I, we make time for what we want to do. If that's sitting in a tree stand someplace or going shopping or, or spending time with friends or talking to somebody, we spend time doing what we want to. Amen or oh me? Oh me. We do. So someplace in here, if we're going to, if all the things in my life are going to line up, man, the priority for me of 2020 is 2020 ought to be the year of no excuses. Say that. The year of no excuses. It ought to, you ought to get used to that coming out of your mouth. It ought to be the year of no excuses for my relationship with God because 
Jesus loved me first. He loved me best. He loved me most. He gave his life for me. He died in my place. And, and if I'm going to truly follow him, he bids me to come and follow him. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, wrote years ago, he said, when Jesus bids a man to come, when he calls him to come, he bids him to come and die. It sounds dramatic, but it's true. It's, it's, it's one of those passages I'm going to point to as we get started here. Jesus calls us to lay down our stuff and to pick up his. If we're truly his followers, his stuff is going to be a priority. And you and I can say, well, I'm just not a reader. Well, we got things on our phone that will read it to you now. That excuse is gone. Oh, I'm just not good at that. Well, you don't get good at something until you spend time doing it. I'm just not a good prayer. When was the last time you tried? Amen or oh me. Uh, I just, uh, I'm just not good at sharing my faith with people. When was the last time you even put forth the effort to try? When was the last time you tried and failed? The only, the only terrible witness really a lot of times is a silent witness. When, when you say nothing, it's the sin of silence. You have an opportunity to say something, but you don't. Walk through these passages with me. I'm going to string together a couple of these things through Luke. And, and just and listen with these kind of ears. Luke, Luke's gospel is, is unique. Luke wrote to the Gentile people. He didn't write to people with a Jewish background. He wrote to really the Greek and the Gentile world. Luke also, Dr. Luke, he was a smart dude. He hung out with Paul a lot. Paul discipled him. And, and so Luke, when he writes, he writes a lot about discipleship and the high cost. He writes a lot about the Gentiles, and he writes a lot about the Holy Spirit. Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke, the Good News of Luke, and then he wrote the, the book of Acts. And as you see in the book of Acts, there are several places where Luke is writing where he's hanging out with Paul. When Paul writes his letters later, he says, yeah, Luke is with me, and Demas, a couple other fellas, but he mentions Luke. I like coming to Luke. There are more parables in Luke. There's more of the Holy Spirit talked about in Luke. And Luke presents clearly the high cost of following Jesus. So start off over here in Luke chapter 9. And for some of you, this is a very familiar passage. Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 23. And some of your Bibles, this is red letters. This is Jesus talking. Watch what it says here. I'm reading from the Holman Christian Version. Then he, talking about Jesus, then he said to them all, If anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me will save it. For what does it benefit someone if he gains the whole world and yet loses his or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and that of the Father and the holy angels. And I tell you, there's some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Jesus throwing it down. Here's the high bar, the high standard. He says, if you're going to come follow me, you must be willing to deny yourself. That's hard for our culture because we're me-centered, right? Right? Deny yourself, take up your cross. What does that mean? The crossing in the ancient world was a symbol of capital punishment. That the people who carried their cross through the streets and, and were crucified on the sides of the road because they wanted to make a public spectacle in this punishment of people so that no one else did what these people did. When you carried your cross, you were, that was it. You were walking on to death. And when Jesus bids a man to come, he calls him to come and die. What it means is, I am willing to give up everything to follow Jesus. If, I, if anyone wants to follow him, they must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow him. Follow him. The word Christian means little Christ in Greek. It was a, almost a derogatory term that, that people in Antioch said, oh, look at those people, those followers of the way, those followers of Jesus, they're a bunch of little Christs. Can you see somebody saying it that way? Those Christians, those little Jesus people. What a badge of honor for somebody to be able to say, you look like Jesus. Wow. When Jesus bids a man to come, he bids him to come and die. Go over to chapter 14. 
Uh, we'll do 12, uh, no, let me think. Let's do the end of 9 first, let's go there. 9.57. This is where the excuses start. In Luke 9.57 it says this, And as they were traveling on the road, someone said to him, I'll follow you wherever you go. It's quick lip service, right? But Jesus told him, foxes have dens, the the birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And he said to another one, follow me. Lord, he said, let me first go bury my father. Excuse. But he told him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and spread the news of the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first go and say goodbye to those in my house. And Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Sounds a little harsh. Jesus is calling us to a high, a high standard. He tells a parable over in chapter 14. Go over to chapter 14. And I think it really goes with this passage we just read. Luke 14, beginning verse 15. Jesus is hanging out at somebody's place with a lot of par- people around. They're eating together. It said, when one of those who reclined at the table with him at this, this gathering heard these things, he said, blessed is the one who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. And Jesus told him, a man was giving a large banquet, invited many, and at the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who were invited, come, because everything's ready now. But without exception, they all began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I bought a field, and I must go out and see it. I ask you to excuse me. Another said, I bought five oxen, or five yoke of oxen, and I'm going to try them out, so you'll have to excuse me. Another said, I just got married, therefore I'm unable to come. So the servant came back and reported these things to his master. And then in anger, the master said to the servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the alleys and bring in the poor and the maimed and the blind and the lame. Master, what what you've ordered has been done and there's still room. And the master told his servant, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel them or make them come in so that my house may be filled. And I tell you, not one of those people who were invited will enjoy my banquet. These people were throwing down excuses. The first one, Jesus, uh, in this parable, it says, come to the banquet. It's, it's the picture of Jesus saying, come and follow me. And the first guy said, hey, I just bought a field. I've got to go check it out. How many of you would buy a piece of property without looking at it? Raise your hand. I, when I first moved here 14 years ago, my wife hadn't been here yet. I was trying to, trying to find temporary housing. And a friend of mine uh, was living on, uh, as a caretaker for these 700 acres he was at one end, at the, at the other end there was a log cabin, and I had my wife and my boys were 12 and 9. I'm thinking, great, log cabin in the woods. I'm thinking, sign me up. So when we brought the U-Haul from Georgia to uh, uh, Defiance, Missouri, my whole life I lived in denial, and then I was living in Defiance. Some of you will get that later. Um, but we pulled up in the U-Haul, and the small group from the church was there, and Julie had never seen this house, and all these people she didn't know, and she's turtle girl. She's shy, and she's like, oh, my goodness, you know, kind of thing. Who got brownie points in that one? Not me. <laughs> Why? Because we, I found us a place to live that she had never seen, and I didn't run it by her, and, and you know, there's relationship there. How many of you would buy a piece of property you never looked at? No one. This guy was making an excuse. He's like, oh, you're inviting me to come. I just can't come because i got to go look at this thing I should have looked at already. Right. Uh, excuse. I had a football coach in high school who said, Bicidecki, don't, don't give me that. Don't make excuses. I said, sir, that's a reason. Because <laughs> it's just me being smart. And he said, nope, that's an excuse. Nope, that's an excuse. The second one, he says, I bought five yoke of oxen. Now, How many of you have bought a car? I mean, we have good car salesmen in here, right? How many of you have bought a car without taking a test drive? Somebody? One of you? (laughs) Way to go. Get her number. Nobody does that. Why? You go test drive the thing, you check it out or whatever else. This guy... Who out of you is going to, on your farm, you're going to get five yoke of oxen, you never check them out. Some dude's going to stick you with lame cows, right? You're going to get, who's going to do that? Nobody. It's an excuse. 
The third one, I just got married. <laughs> My son got married last night. I don't think he's going anywhere but someplace with his wife. Maybe the, I think they're going to Gatlinburg, right? But this guy's giving an excuse. Wouldn't you want to bring your girl? Wouldn't you want to bring your woman? They're being invited to a banquet, a party, and your woman's not going to get, want to go get all dressed up and go to some banquet, right? No, dude's making an excuse. What's your excuse? The King of Kings and Lord of Lords is inviting you into partnership and relationship with Him. And we make excuses. Oh, I'm too busy. My work schedule is crazy. I, I, I work so much. Or how about this one? I'm retired. I don't have time. <laughs> Somebody told me when they get retired, they get more busy than they were before. Some of that kind of stuff. We make excuses. What's some other excuses that we've made? Anybody? We don't want to own them, do we? <laughs> uh, I don't have time. I'm not that smart. I don't do that. That's not my thing. Here's one. I leave that to my wife. She's the, she's the Jesus follower. She's the good one. And, you know, I'm just glad to be with. No. Your wife's not going to stand for personal responsibility before the king. You're going to stand before the king. We all will stand individually. And I'm not going to be able to say it was her fault. She's not going to be able to say that grumpy man I'm married to. No. You're going to give an account for you. And you're not going to be able to say, well, I just didn't have enough time. You play words with friends more than that. You, you watch TV more than that. You binge watch Netflix more than that. Don't, amen or oh me. We find a million different excuses. We ought to spend more time or less time in, on Facebook and more time with our face in the book. I'm speaking in bumper stickers this morning. For some, yeah, for some of you young people, it's Instagram or Snapchat. I'm just <laughs> translating. All right. What's your excuse? I mean, think about it. What's the last thing you told Jesus? I can't do that. I'm not a public speaker. I can't go out of my way. That would be uncomfortable. I can't say that. Why, watch this. How it goes. Jesus loves you. Was that hard? Say it with me. Jesus loves you. Oh, I think you can do it. You don't have an excuse. I've made too many excuses. I, 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 I've been those guys. I've been the guy that say, well, I can't do this and I can't do that. Jesus, when he says, come, he's calling us to a high and holy state. He wants everything you've got. He doesn't want you to play around. He doesn't, he doesn't want your excuses. He died in your place, and you're not even willing to live for him. All of us. Go down to uh, verse 25 of chapter 14. This is powerful. These, these stories... Uh, Jesus is getting ready to tell. Watch this. He says, Now the great crowds were traveling with him, and so he turned to them. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. For whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you wanting to build a tower doesn't first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, after he's laid a foundation and cannot finish it, all the onlookers will begin to ridicule him. This man started to build a building he wasn't able to finish. Can you hear that? Or what king deciding to go to war with another king will not first sit down and decide if he's able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes at him with 20,000? And if not, while he's still afar off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. In the same way, therefore, every one of you who does not renounce all of his possessions cannot be my disciple. Jesus throws it down. Is there something in your life more important than Jesus? If you are truly going to be a follower of Jesus, if 2020 is going to be the year of no excuses, a follower of Jesus really cannot love something more than Jesus. It says, renounce all of your possessions. That includes my coffee roaster. <laughs> that includes all of my power tools in the kitchen and in the garage. It, it includes my possessions. So Someone was telling me, 
they, uh, they go to a lot of estate sales, right? And they go pick up bargains at estate sales. Why are they bargains? Because people stockpile their house with all these collectibles and all this stuff and all this furniture and all these things, and it's only important to them. And when they pass, their kids don't want it. Their kids don't want all their, their you know, cups from all the state capitals, <laughs> right? They don't want all their little shot glasses from every place from here to Las Vegas, you know, they don't want all their signs on the whole, you know, Route 66, because nobody cares. I was thinking about it. I got all these cool coffee cups from all over the world. My boys don't want that stuff. They don't. They don't care. I'm collecting stuff that I'm just going to pile up and use a whole lot of money to fill my house with junk that somebody's going to have to get rid of, and they're going to pay cheap prices for it when they come to get it when I'm gone. I don't think that. That's not a smart thing at all. But that's what we do. Are you willing to lay down all of your prized possessions for the sake of knowing Jesus? Matthew 6.33 says, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Right? That's the Bible verse me and the guys in my dorm in college used. We paraphrase it a little bit. Seek first the kingdom of God. That's be all in with Jesus. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and God will give you a babe later. Because we, we wanted a babe for Jesus. But you know what I needed more? Jesus. I, I need Jesus. I can't, I can't love my stuff more than I love Jesus. My car, my, my, my golf clubs, my, my whatever. I can't love that more than Jesus. And all those things will pass away. They're unimportant. I like them, but they're, they're, they're nothing. I can't love people. I can't love someone more than I love Jesus. This passage here and other passages, it says, if you don't hate your father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, Jesus is using hyperbole. It's over-exaggeration for effect. He's saying, if your love for Jesus, it ought to be up here, and it'd be so strong that in comparison, your love for anybody else looks like hatred. Does that make sense? That I love Jesus, and I love my wife, but the comparison is no comparison. I wrote this uh, several years ago. I was a young pastor, and I was doing some discipleship things, had a large group of people, you know, very young believers. That Most of them had maybe been in church for a long time, but never followed Jesus. And so there's all these people of all ages and stuff sitting in the room, and I had written down several statements about following Jesus. And a couple of them, I pitched in some of these Bible passages. And a guy in the back raised his hand. He said, Rick, I disagree with this statement right here. I, I, I just think you've gone too far here. And then I held up my Bible. It's in red letters, I think. Those aren't Rick's words. Those are Jesus' words. It just seems so crazy I, that my love for Jesus makes my love for anyone else look like hatred. You know what? I love my mom and dad. They were crazy, screwed up people. My dad passed, my mom's still alive, and, you know, I love her. But she's, she's had life stuff, right? I love my wife. You know, I, I mean, I like you people, but I wouldn't trade, do, do anything in comparison to, I, I love my wife. She's more important than all you guys. Amen. <laughs> and honey, as you're watching this on video, okay. My boys, I love my boys, Caleb and Will. I've had them a long time. They're my favorite. I tell my boys ever since they were little kids, I tuck them in bed at night, I tell Caleb, you're my favorite Caleb in the whole planet. Will, you're my favorite Will on the whole planet. And they're both now, as of last night, both of them married men, and they are still my favorites. But in comparison to loving Jesus, it looks like disdain. Because I love Jesus more. And I love my boys. I, I, the Bible says I, I can't love anybody more than I love Jesus. There are sometimes people in church that they don't do stuff because their spouse or, spouse or significant other or their best friends or the group of people they hang out with wouldn't like somebody being more spiritual than them. There, but there are a lot of wives who come to church by themselves. 
Keep doing it. There are a lot of husbands who come to church by themselves. Keep doing it. When I was a teenager, none of the rest of my family went to church. I was the only one. And you know what? I loved my family, but I was in church every Sunday because I wanted more of Jesus than anything else. And I took the ridicule from family or friends or whoever else, and I, and I put up with that stuff because my love for Jesus was more. I can't love my stuff more than Jesus. I can't, I, I can't love someone more than Jesus. That includes me. There are a lot of us who love ourselves more than we love Jesus. Paul said in Galatians 2.20, he said, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. I, I, I've got nothing left of me. My destination, where I live, my job, my calling, my everything else, I laid that down at the foot of the cross because he is everything and I am his follower. I'm his servant. I am a man under authority and I go where I'm told and he is God. he's a bossy thing. He'll tell you to do stuff you don't want to do. But though he slay me, yet shall I trust him. Here's a big one. We shouldn't love our stuff more than we love Jesus. We shouldn't love someone more than we love Jesus. And we shouldn't love security or safety more than we love Jesus. Because when we come up to the line of a faith step, God tells you to go do something or say something or leave something or invest in something or give your money that you have to, to give your money away. God calls you to a step of faith to, to go and do or say or be something and you're insecure, what's going to happen? What, you know, and so then we get an analysis paralysis. We don't do anything. We just stop. God, you've asked too much of me. God, you're calling me too far. God, that will cost me more than I am willing to pay for the sake of my own safety and my own security. Are you willing to be secure? but not in the presence of Jesus? I'd rather be in the middle of the ocean on a ship in a, in a typhoon with Jesus than on rock-solid land in the sunshine. I've been in both. And it's a whole lot better to be with him any place than, than to be without him. You look at this, uh, this passage, Jesus says, would you want to be the person... Can you imagine on, on I-55, maybe one of the Cape exits, you're a part of a company that goes to build a building. And, and you start to build a building. You lay the foundation. It's supposed to be this 15-story building. It's supposed to be gorgeous and beautiful. And the pictures are up all over town. And you get two stories in and you run out of money. How many people and they brother going to see that building and make fun of you? Don't you know? There was... I used to live uh, in this place, and down the road there was this big fancy, you know, million dollar house going in, and I kept watching, you know, hey, that looks cool, I wonder if they got a basketball court inside, or a pool or something, I mean, it looked really cool. They got halfway through it, and they stopped construction. A year, <coughs> two years, three years went by, the half built, you know, behemoth of a building began to cave in on, each, on itself, and it was discolored. And every time I drove by it, I kept thinking, didn't they pay attention to how much it was going to cost them before they started? Didn't they think about, you know, the materials and all this kind of stuff? Because that's a waste of money. Who would want to waste their money like that? And a little bit on the inside, I was like, man, what were they thinking? God's calling you. He's calling you to figure out, are you willing to pay the price? He's bidding you to come. Are you going to start the Christian life and get a little bit into it and then quit? And then people look at you and say, yeah, I knew it wouldn't last. I knew he'd get over it. I knew it wasn't real for her. I'm all in. The second part of that is a, he said, talks about a battle. Imagine a, a general having 10,000 soldiers decides to go into battle with some other guy who has 20,000. Does he want to have all of his men killed? Does he want to lose? So he has to think, are my guys better than their guys? Or do I need to send a delegation with some happy stuff and some prizes and compromise before he gets here? You've got to do that. You've got to weigh that out. Is your life better without Jesus? It's a big question. Are you content living in excuses 
Or are you willing to take the faith journey, the risk, the take the step of faith to not just sit back and play a little bit at following Jesus, but are you willing finally to follow Jesus with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your checkbook, with all your calendar, with all of your future, with all of your decisions, with all of your everything? Are you willing for the first time in a powerful way to say, you know what, forgetting those things are which are behind, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus has taken hold of me. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and share in the fellowship of his sufferings. 1 Peter 2 says, To this you were called. Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. And yet we live a life of security and ease and safety. We take no risks for the gospel. We're content where we are and we make excuses to say, That's not me. That's not my gift. I just couldn't do it. I'm not that good. When Moses stood before the Lord and God said, uh, hey, I want you to go speak to the Pharaoh for my people. He said, but I, I, I stutter. And God said, who made your mouth, boy? I added the boy part. Who made your mouth? Am I not creator of the universe? Can I not even use you? What's your excuse? I'm too old. I'm too young. I'm too rich. I'm too poor. I got too much stuff. I have nothing. I don't know what to do. Jesus said, come to me. My, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. And yet it costs me everything. There have been a lot of times I could have done something more easy. I could have taken an easier path. Could have made a lot more cash. I, I could have done it for me. For me and my wife, for me and my family. I, I could have taken an easy path. But God has called me to put it all on the table. And so sometimes in my life it's cost me houses. Sometimes in my life it's cost me friends and family. Sometimes in my life it's caused me ease and safety. But though he slay me, yet shall I trust him. He has always been faithful. Put him to the test. Oh, it's not easy, but it's right. He calls you to live a life of no excuses. Do you have your list? What's on your list? It'll cost me too much. I don't know enough. I'm too old. I'm too young. What's on your list? What excuse do you give God when he calls you to come and lay it all on the table? That is the question for you today. Because as we walk into 2020, I'm telling you, for me and my house, 2020 is the year of no excuses. I, I'm looking at these guys, and all these people made a whole lot of excuses. I, I, I don't, I don't want to have any anymore. I don't want to have any for my health. I don't want to have any for my finances. I don't want to have any in my relationships. I don't want to have any in my relationship with Jesus. So you got a couple days to think about it. Before we get to January 1, maybe that can be the turning of the day of the calendar, but also the turning of the day in your life that you begin to make a new purpose to say, Jesus, it's all about you and it's not about me. Maybe that can really be a changing point in your life that God begins to use you and he begins to use this church to impact people in this community in a way that you could never dream of. It doesn't just mean you have a big church. It doesn't just mean you get a lot of money. It does mean that when he sees you, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Would you pray with me? God, you are faithful. And too often I make excuses. But Lord, you are good and kind and gracious. I, I don't deserve your love. I don't deserve your grace. I could never earn it. I'm not smart enough. I'm not experienced enough. I don't come from the right family. God, I, I don't deserve any of it. But you, you love me. You forgive me. You pay for my sin. You ease my shame. You love me and you care for me just as I am and, and, and you call me to greater, higher and better and God I, I can't do it on my own 
God, help me to love you and serve you. Help me to be willing to lay aside my excuses for whatever and to step into 2020 and give the whole thing to you. Help. God, I I don't want to get to the end of 2020 and make excuses for the woulda, coulda, shouldas. I want to be able to look back on the end of 2020 and say for the first time, I did it. I made it. Thank you, Jesus. God, help me to put it all in for you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.